sickle. Bleeding saints and forest witches, the past unburied, the books unsealed, the old celebration returning. Hello, and welcome to my study. Please come in and have a seat. All the books surrounding you here are those used to research our show, and the individual here to my right, along with managing domestic duties, serves as our reader for any passages that will be directly quoted from these sources. Her name is Mrs. Carswell. Hello. Well, we had a storm last week, lots of lightning, which gave me the idea for this episode. It was a bad one. I could tell it was coming because the bees weren't going out to forage. We had some branches down and the power went out. We were actually working by candlelight for several hours. I was happy to see you had beeswax candles. They are a superior candle. Their scent is lovely. Sometimes you can pick up a bit of clover or wildflower, depending on where the bees were collecting. I suppose I should call the agent to get someone out to clean up those branches. Not Mr. Petrovich, though, but I don't suppose he's on their list anymore now that he's uh, gone feral. I thought you already called them. I've just been busy. But the branches are gone. It's it's all cleaned up. You you must be confused. No, no, it was cleaned up when I went out yesterday morning. That's not possible. It must have happened at night. I told you I heard something the other night. You just didn't hear them because you were blasting your true crime shows. I can't sleep without them. All that murder and mayhem. I'd have nightmares. Nightmares are part of life. I think I would have heard a saw or a truck or something. And why would anyone do that in the first place? It's probably Mr. Petrovich. That would explain the perimeter fence that was bent down. I thought it was a storm, but... Maybe he dragged the branches out over the fence to the woods to build himself a better shelter. That's ridiculous. I'm sure there are plenty of fallen branches right there in the woods if he wanted to do that. Maybe, maybe he just feels an attachment to the property. Feels it's his duty to take care of things. I don't like that. And he's not getting paid. Were your hives okay? They don't seem to have been disturbed. Thank you for asking. I don't know why you should feel any attachment to this property. Surely he has other things to worry about. I mean, if he's even out there. Oh, I think he is. I still have dreams about him. He's a bear, but he's friendly. He wants me to brush his coat, but I don't trust him. You're in the dream, too. I don't want to hear it. I asked Mr. Petrovich if it isn't hard living out there in the woods all alone. He's a human now, and he's sitting on the sofa next to you... I'm in one chair, but you and he are sitting on the sofa very close. I don't want to. He says he's working on something out there. And there's a whole factory that is turning honey into jewelry, like amber, he says. And he is going to make a fortune. But he needs something from one of your books to complete it all. Uh, uh, And he keeps leaning into you and whispering. I don't want to hear it. There is more to the dream. I have to just leave it there. Like I said, nightmares are part of life, so... uh, Episode 52, The Frankenstein Method. I am your host, Al Reidenauer, and this show, Bone and Sickle, explores the intertwining of horror and folklore in a historical context. I started this show as a way to further explore this area of intersection after writing my book, The Krampus and the Old Dark Christmas. Bone and Sickle only exists thanks to the generosity of our Patreon donors. Our rewards now include a short bonus episode for supporters, which we've gotten some very nice feedback on. I'll have uh, more on that and the other rewards at the end of this episode. of a dead man waiting to live again in a body I made with my own hands. 
with my own hands. But how did he do this, as conceived, that is, in Mary Shelley's novel? And from there, from a story imagined in 1818, how do we get to the creation of the Karloff creature and uh, all the cinematic stories that follow that model? Shelley's Frankenstein actually offers very scant information on the process. Nothing like the dramatic creation scenes a modern filmgoer would expect. Only little hints here and there in Victor Frankenstein's narrative, or Dr. Frankenstein as he's erroneously known. Um, Shelley's Frankenstein is a mere college student actually, working in an attic, not a, a doctor of anything. Anyway, he says, I collected bones from charnel houses and disturbed with profane fingers the tremendous secrets of the human frame. And? The dissecting room and the slaughterhouse furnished many of my materials. So, he is fabricating his creature from component materials, uh, tissues, and whole systems built up or perhaps even grown over those uh, charnel house bones. And from slaughterhouses, he employs uh, certain elements that uh, aren't even human. He's not simply stitching together whole human parts, as in our films, but the large stature of the creature in her novel does match our uh, cinematic image. And there's a uh, practical reason for this. As the minuteness of the parts formed a great hindrance to my speed, I resolved to make the being of a gigantic stature that is to say, about eight feet in height and proportionately large. And though Frankenstein's intent was to create beauty, the uh, exemplary atom of a new race, it doesn't turn out quite like this. His yellow skin scarcely covered the work of muscles and arteries beneath. His hair was of a lustrous black and flowing, his teeth of a pearly whiteness. But these luxuriances only formed a more horrid contrast with his watery eyes that seemed almost the same color as the dun white sockets in which they were set, his shriveled complexion and straight black lips. The phrase, work of muscles and arteries beneath, again hints at this notion of a living creature built up from rudimentary organic elements a process all the more magical 142 years before the first human organ transplant. In 1818, science as a field of empirical study was in its infancy. The term science itself simply meant knowledge in a general sense back then. It would have been natural philosophy that fascinated Victor. His early studies, Shelley tells us, were devoted to the centuries-old writings of uh, Cornelius Agrippa, Albertus Magnus, and uh, Paracelsus, philosophers whose work also embraced alchemy and the occult. Victor says, The raising of ghosts or devils was a promise, liberally accorded by my favorite authors. Agrippa was popularly regarded as a necromancer in his day. Albertus Magnus was at once a theologian and esteemed doctor of the church, but also said to be an alchemist and wizard, one who had constructed an all-knowing automaton, or brass head of the type uh, mentioned in our uh, Lost Heads episode. Victor's reading of Paracelsus offers some interesting connections. Born in Switzerland, like Victor, this 16th century physician, alchemist, and philosopher was a figure in Europe's rediscovery of classical learning. Along with natural philosophy, he pursued hermeticism and alchemy. In his alchemical writings, he discussed the creation of homunculi, or a homunculus, a diminutive human grown in a glass bottle, something that should sound familiar to those who've seen Universal's 1935 picture. The Bride of Frankenstein. That line is triumphantly spoken at the movie's climax by Frankenstein's uh, accomplice in monster making, the uh, delightful Dr. Pretorius. Earlier in the film, he displays his own experimental efforts in creating living beings. You think I'm mad. Perhaps I am. But listen, Henry Frankenstein, while you were digging in your graves, piecing together dead tissues, I, my dear pupil, went for my material to the source of life. I grew my creatures. 
like cultures, grew them as nature does, from seed. But still, you did it. In this strange scene, Pretorius exhibits a collection of tiny living humans in glass bottles a king, a queen, a ballerina, archbishop, and a mermaid. Now, what makes this particularly interesting is the resemblance of this scene to one described in an 1896 biography of Paracelsus by the German theosophist Franz Hartmann. He relates a legend of similar beings, homunculi, grown not by Paracelsus himself, but by an Austrian Freemason in 1755, Count Johann Ferdinand von Kufstein, whose work closely followed the method described by Paracelsus and was done in collaboration with an Italian mystic and Rosicrucian, Abbe Geloni. There were ten homunculi, or as he calls them, prophesying spirits, preserved in strong bottles such as are used to preserve fruit and which were filled with water. They were made in the course of five weeks and consisted of a king, a queen, a knight, a monk, a nun, an architect, a minor, and a seraph, and finally, of a blue and red spirit. The bottles were closed with ox bladders and with a great magic seal. The spirit swam about in those bottles and were about one span long, and the count was very anxious that they would grow. They were therefore buried under two cartloads of horse manure. And uh, all of this in accordance with Paracelsus's uh, guidelines. The pile was daily sprinkled with a certain liquor, prepared with great trouble by the two adepts, and made out of some very disgusting materials. The pile of manure began after such sprinklings to ferment and steam as if heated by a subterranean fire, and at least once every three days, when everything was quiet at the approach of night, the two gentlemen would leave the convent and go to pray and to fumigate at that pile of manure. After the bottles were removed, the spirits had grown to be each one about one and a half span long, so that the bottles were almost too small to contain them, and the male homunculi had come into possession of heavy beards, and the nails of their fingers and toes had grown a great deal. Abbe Geloni provided them with appropriate clothing, each one according to his rank and dignity. Hartman describes how the bottles were carried to meetings at the Masonic Lodge, during which they gave prophecies about future events that usually proved to be correct, each making a prediction according to its particular identity. The uh, king, for instance, addressing politics, the monk religion, and so on. Unfortunately, the monk one day falls to the floor and dies, and the count, attempting to uh, grow a new monk without the Italian cleric's assistance, produced only a small thing like a leech, which held very little vitality and soon died. Hartman then goes on to describe a scene that's directly copied in The Bride of Frankenstein when Pretorius exhibits his experiment. One day, the king escaped from his bottle, which had not been properly sealed, and was found sitting on top of the bottle containing the queen, attempting to scratch with his nails a seal away and to liberate her. Then, of course, we had to have a king. Now he's so madly in love with her that we have to segregate them. Now, now, I have to be very careful with the king. But this isn't science. It's more like black magic. Black magic, black magic, black magic. As sometimes another alchemist suggested as inspiration for Frankenstein, Johann Conrad von Dippel. In particular, because the location of his birth in 1673 is listed as Borg Frankenstein. With Castle Frankenstein on a hill near the city of Darmstadt, Germany. This connection was first made in 1975 by a Romanian scholar Radu Florescu in his book In Search of Frankenstein, a follow-up to his In Search of Dracula. Uh, Mary and Percy Shelley were known to have visited the area, and von Dippel was certainly an alchemist, but descriptions of his activities that have appeared since Florescu's book tend to wildly exaggerate or even fabricate 
certain diabolical aspects of the man and his work. Von Dippel was a controversial figure, but more for his failure to pay debts and for his uh, writings as a heterodox pietist theologian than for any uh, grave robbing or other atrocities. Black magic, black magic, black magic, black magic. However, uh, suitably grisly ingredients, namely uh, charred animal bones and hides figured into his alchemical work. An oil was extracted from these, one he identified with the elixir of life. For something called the elixir of life, uh, Dipple's oil is rather nasty stuff, a blackish, uh, foul-smelling concoction. And while it wasn't uh, widely recognized as the uh, universal medicine Dipple described it as, it was once prescribed against fevers, bad nerves, and epilepsy. Later, it was regarded as uh, fit only as a measure against uh, predators and parasites preying on livestock or fruit trees. Thanks to its foul smell, it was also briefly used by the German military during World War II as a chemical agent. You can still find it sold as a bone oil, or even occasionally as Dippel's oil, for use against uh, parasites and predators on farms, or for, as uh, fox oil when it's used to repel foxes from hen houses. Von Dippel also uh, invented or played a role in inventing the pigment known as Prussian blue. There's a, a charming legend associated with his death, which occurred at the age of 63 rather than 135, as he'd hoped regular doses of his uh, elixir would ensure. Anyway, supposedly his death resulted from imbibing a batch of Prussian blue mistaken for this uh, elixir, leaving his funeral guests to marvel at the wondrously dyed blue corpse in his coffin. It was on a dreary night of November that I beheld the accomplishment of my toils. With an anxiety that almost amounted to agony, I collected the instruments of life around me that I might infuse a spark of being into the lifeless thing that lay at my feet. It was already one in the morning. The rain pattered dismally against the panes, and my candle was nearly burnt out, when, by the glimmer of the half-extinguished light, I saw the dull yellow eye of the creature open. It breathed hard, and a convulsive motion agitated its limbs. This uh, enigmatic, understated creation scene clearly lacks all the crashing thunder and arcing electricity. The only hint of it comes in Shelley's phrase, The spark of being. Which certainly does not demand a literal interpretation as electricity, but there are other hints in the novel suggesting electricity may play a role in Victor Frankenstein's mysterious creation. A thunderstorm young Victor witnesses at the age of 15 is described in more lavish detail than she actually devotes to the animation of the creature. It advanced from behind the mountains of Jura and the thunder burst at once with a frightful loudness from various quarters of the heavens. And as I stood at the door, on a sudden, I beheld a stream of fire issue from an old and beautiful oak which stood about twenty yards from our house. And so soon as the dazzling light vanished, the oak had disappeared, and nothing remained but a blasted stump. The awesome power behind all this excites in the young prodigy a fascination with electricity encouraged by an unidentified scholar who happens to be visiting the Frankensteins. He offers Victor. Explanation of a theory which he had formed on the subject of electricity and galvanism, which was at once new and astonishing to me. All that he said threw greatly into the shade Cornelius Agrippa, Albertus Magnus, and Paracelsus, the lords of my imagination. So, while retaining the alchemist's audacious desire to create life itself, as with our homunculi, Victor might now employ in his quest new ideas from the field of galvanism. The storm will be magnificent. All the electrical secrets of heaven. And this time we're ready. 
I should probably fill in some details here, as I'm using the word galvanism, basically, in place of uh, electricity. It's uh, the Italian Luigi Galvani who lent his name to this field. In uh, 1781, while dissecting a frog near a device Galvani had built to uh, collect static electricity, his assistant touched a nerve in the creature's leg which caused it to jump. Out of curiosity, Galvani began a series of experiments touching lifeless frogs with different metals and producing the same action. He theorized that something called animal electricity resided within the creature's body causing these actions. He was promptly attacked by Alessandro Volto, who believed instead that the cause of all this was an energized field produced by the proximity of two different metals. Uh, to prove his theory, he constructed what we now call a battery, then a uh, voltaic pile or voltaic stack, consisting of layers of two different metals separated by brine-soaked paper, and giving us the term voltage along the way, of course. All of this was of great interest to the educated elites to which Mary and Percy Shelley belonged. Mary's father, the noted philosopher and writer William Godwin, was friends with uh, Britain's leading students of this emerging science, Humphrey Davy and uh, William Nicholson. And in the journals of Percy's longtime friend, Thomas Jefferson Hogue, the author notes that Shelley treated his room at Oxford as a sort of laboratory, collecting in it an electrical machine, an air pump, the galvanic trough, a solar microscope, and a small glass retort above an ardent lamp. More telling is the fact that a beloved tutor of Percy's, the Scottish physician James Lind, was known to have recreated Galvani's frog experiment before a royal audience, including the king and queen. And there were letters between the tutor and student discussing Shelley attempting the experiment himself. While it's not explicit or prominent in the text of Frankenstein, Shelley makes clear in an introduction added to the 1831 edition that galvanism played an important role in her conception of the tale. In it, she refers to the inspiration for her book in the uh, ghost story challenge undertaken by Byron and his guests, the Shelley's and John Polidori, something I discussed in episode 20 a bit. Um, and she recalls a discussion between her husband and Lord Byron that seeded her imagination. They talked of the experiments of Dr. Darwin. I speak not of what the doctor really did or said that he did, but as more to my purpose, of what was then spoken of as having been done by him. So it's Darwin... Who preserved a piece of vermicelli in a glass case, till by some extraordinary means it began to move with voluntary motion. Perhaps a corpse would be reanimated. Galvanism have given token of such things. Perhaps the component parts of a creature might be manufactured, brought together, and endowed with vital warmth. If you had not known that Frankenstein was inspired by the uh, wiggling of a bit of pasta, don't feel bad. Mary does insert that disclaimer that she's not describing the actual experiment conducted by Darwin, who um, would be Erasmus in this case, the grandfather of Charles. But instead, it's a recalled version of what those in the conversation recalled of the experiment. What everyone involved in this uh, sort of game of telephone is trying to describe is actually not uh, vermicelli or vermicelli, but instead probably vorticelli, a type of uh, protozoa which Darwin mentions in an 1802 essay describing creatures that, when removed from water, appear to enter a sort of suspended animation from which they can be revived. While Luigi Galvani, in a general way, seems to have inspired an aspect of Shelley's tale, certain experiments by his nephew, Giovanni Aldini, feel much closer to the creation of the monster as we know it. Aldini succeeded his uncle as a professor of physics at the University of Bologna, and while it was hardly his only interest, he's largely remembered for taking his predecessor's experiments to the next level. He moved from frogs to oxen, observing that when a charge was passed through them, the irritation of the organs was so great that the whole head was put into most violent agitation. That same year, 1803, while in London, Aldini obtained permission to attempt the same 
with the body of a criminal, George Foster, who had murdered his wife and child and was due to be hung. Shortly after the execution, the body was conveyed to a nearby house where Aldini and his associates had gathered. It's all described in the Newgate Calendar, a publication I'd mentioned before, which offered uh, reports on executions and criminality in a sensational yet moralizing form that anticipated the Victorian penny dreadful. On the first application of the process to the face, the jaws of the deceased criminal began to quiver, and the adjoining muscles were horribly contorted, and one eye was actually open. In the subsequent part of the process, the right hand was raised and clenched, and legs and thighs were set in motion. Mr. Pass, the beadle of the surgeon's company, who was officially present during this experiment, was so alarmed that he died of fright soon after his return home. Well, this is the only death resulting from fear his experiments generated. It is not the only time this sort of panicked reaction has been remarked upon. In his own book from 1819, General Views on the Application of Galvanism to Medical Purposes, Aldini describes an experiment with the heads of two executed prisoners that uh, observers found deeply unsettling uses the word uh, communication here to describe uh, making an electrical circuit and pile for the uh, galvanic battery or pile, of course. I made a communication with the pile from the left ear of one to the right ear of the other. It was surprising and even frightful to see these two heads making at the same time horrible contortions as if at each other, so that some of the spectators who were not prepared for such results were exceedingly terrified. Even more ambitious than Aldini's work was the related experiment conducted by the Scottish physician Andrew Yore in Glasgow in 1818, the same year Shelley wrote her book, so unlikely to have been an actual influence, but I think listeners will still find it worth a shudder. Here, the executed body belonged to one Matthew Clydesdale, charged with murdering an elderly gentleman, This one drew a large crowd to the anatomy theater where the experiment was conducted, and the intent here was explicitly to see if it were possible to revive the man. The scene was described in an 1820 edition of the American journal, The Medical Repository, connecting two electric rods to the subject's heel and spinal cord, respectively, produced a violent extension of the leg as nearly to overturn one of the assistants. When the rod touching the heel was moved to the diaphragm, the success of it was truly wonderful. Full but laborious breathing instantly commenced. The chest heaved and fell. The belly was protruded and again collapsed with a retiring and collapsing diaphragm. Then the rod is moved to the supraorbital nerve, which enervates the nasal and upper eyelid region. Varying degrees of voltage produce a dreadful range of results. Most horrible grimaces were exhibited. Rage, horror, despair, anguish, and ghastly smiles united their hideous expression in the murderer's face, surpassing far the wildest representations of a fuseli or a keen. At this period, several spectators were forced to leave the apartment from terror or sickness, and one gentleman fainted. And unfortunately, the corpse did not return to life. Another experimenter representative of this uh, contemporary British fascination with electricity would be Andrew Cross. Like Humphrey Davis, a friend of Shelley's father, Cross dedicated himself to the construction of large voltaic piles his being some of the largest ever created. Working in isolation at his mansion in the wilds of Somerset's Quantock Hills, Cross amassed a collection of some 2,500 voltaic piles. He strung a third of a mile of copper wire through the trees on the estate to create a vast web used to measure and accumulate electrostatic charges in the air. These wires terminated at equipment located in the mansion's music room where, particularly during times of fog or approaching thunderstorms, 
He was able to charge and discharge the energy up to 20 times a minute, manipulating it with an insulated rod, and in the process, releasing blinding flashes and explosions that echoed through the countryside. Cross himself was rather amazed by this phenomenon, describing in a letter five hour long, streams of fire which must be witnessed to be believed. Locals, many of whom believed he was actually creating storms on his estate, dubbed him the Thunder and Lightning Man. One encounter with a local farmer quoted in the 1857 volume, Memorial, Scientific and Literary of Andrew Cross, the electrician, puts the local lore colorfully. You can't go near his cursed house at night without danger of your life. Them as have been there have seen devils all surrounded by lightning dancing on the wires that he has put up round his grounds. It's been claimed that Mary Shelley actually heard Cross speak in London in 1814 based on a journal entry mentioning her and Percy attending a lecture on electricity, the gases, and the phantasmagoria. But the announcement I find for that in the London Times uh, makes no mention of Cross, and I don't find any other evidence for that elsewhere. But there is an individual researcher clearly referenced in Shelley's work as an inspiration to Victor Frankenstein. And he's hardly an obscure figure, certainly not for Americans who regard him as one of the nation's founding fathers. It's Benjamin Franklin. In his famous 1752 experiment, Franklin, of course, conveyed the electrostatic charge of a thunderstorm down to earth via a wet silk cord trailed by a kite equipped with a metal spindle. In the original 1818 publication of Shelley's novel, this experiment is clearly referenced in the passage about the tree being blasted by lightning. The catastrophe of this tree excited my extreme astonishment, and I eagerly inquired of my father the nature and origin of thunder and lightning. He replied, electricity, describing at the same time the various effects of that power. He constructed a small electrical machine and exhibited a few experiments. He made also a kite with a wire and string which drew down that fluid from the clouds. If this comes as a surprise, it's because the passage was removed from the uh, 1831 edition generally read. Uh, when Shelley realized that Victor's father, as she'd previously described him, was supposed to have little interest in science, she reassigned that role to an unnamed visitor, as we heard earlier, and eliminated any reference to a kite experiment. But it's also worth noting that Franklin may be present in the novel's title, Frankenstein or the Modern Prometheus, referencing the Greek Titan who stole fire from the gods. And that term, Modern Prometheus, was actually coined in 1755 by German philosopher Immanuel Kant, as the uh, title for an article specifically describing Franklin's work and cautioning against the wild extravagances of unbridled curiosity. So, while Shelley's novel has something of the notion of lightning being an influence on Victor Frankenstein, the image of electricity animating the creature standardized by Universal's 1930s movies had to still evolve through a long process which began with theatrical adaptations. Shelley herself attended the first of these, which opened in 1823. Presumption, or the fate of Frankenstein. The play was quite successful, which pleased Shelley and led to a new edition of the novel being published. Though, according to a letter written to one of uh, the couple's friends, she found the story in the play poorly managed. One change was that the creature no longer had a voice. Nevertheless, she found the actor T.P. Cook playing this role. Rather good. Commenting on a scene which seems to resemble Karloff's uh, mute interaction with a sunbeam in the 1931 picture. She writes, His trying to grasp at the sounds he heard, all indeed he does was well imagined and executed. Already in this production, a number of modifications were made that have survived into the uh, monster's cinematic uh, incarnations. In addition to making the creature mute, the identity of the actor playing him was left blank in the program, 
just as uh, Karloff's monster is identified only by a question mark in the uh, 1931 credit roll. And a uh, laboratory assistant is introduced into the story and given the name Fritz, as in the 1931 picture. His role is mostly comic, something I'm guessing was uh, borrowed from Marlowe's and uh, other productions of Dr. Faustus that included such a comic figure. While audiences of the play don't see the creation, they watch Fritz witness it through a great flickering with blue, then red light at the moment it all happens, and Fritz cries, It lives! The line or a version of it that's uh, familiar from our films, but it was missing completely in Shelley's low-key creation scene. Observing the form rising to life, Fritz then cries, There's a hub hobgoblin 20 feet high, wrapped in a mantle. Mercy, mercy! Amid glowing red smoke, the creature appears half wrapped in a sort of toga, according to the playbill image which I'll post. And throughout the play, the script and characters simply refer to him as... The Demon. In fact, this was the designation in another play rushed out the same year as Presumption. That is uh, Henry M. Milner's The Demon of Switzerland. I don't find much on that one, but Milner wrote a better-known version of the story three years later called... The Man and the Monster, or The Fate of Frankenstein. Which was described in the play script as... A peculiar, romantic, melodramatic, pantomime spectacle. Pantomime, here in the old sense of a comic play that could include songs and dance, I think this one would have fit that category by virtue of uh, comic interludes uh, featuring Frankenstein's assistant, the uh, Fritz character who's here called uh, Strut. Again portrayed as mute, the monster's first moment of life is for the first time directly and vividly represented. The script calls for a dramatic music cue as he begins visibly breathing on the table, and Frankenstein rolls back the black covering, which discovers a colossal human figure of a cadaverous, livid complexion. The play also introduces an angry mob pursuing the creature, who meets his end by plunging into a volcano. In presumption, by the way, both the creature and creator are killed in an alpine avalanche. And there are songs in that play, too. The idea of electricity animating the monster was still absent by the time the story was first adapted for film. This was in 1910 with the Edison Studios 13-minute production simply called Frankenstein. Here we see Victor Frankenstein brewing up his creation in a vat, pouring in chemicals producing flashes of smoke, and then closing the immense cauldron within a sort of oven or chamber where the miracle occurs. Audiences of the film are treated to what's hidden within, a um, genuinely interesting effect achieved by using footage of burning or melting life-size puppet in the pot run in reverse to portray the monster taking shape. The creature which emerges sports wild hair and tattered clothes and body padding to increase his bulk as well as a headpiece extending his forehead in a way that hints at the uh, Karloff look. The 1931 film was itself an adaptation of a theatrical production, as had been the case with Universal's other hit, Dracula. The play Chosen was a 1927 production scripted by a British playwright, Peggy Webling, called Frankenstein, an adventure in the macabre. Still, no lightning or electricity in this one. In uh, Webling's Frankenstein, she harkens back to the um, alchemical mode, with Frankenstein following an ancient recipe for... The elixir of life. ...to uh, animate his creature. And uh, not doing this in a garret workshop or a half-ruined castle, but in a contemporary living room, it turns out. The play was uh, greatly reworked for the Universal Picture, but certain Webling touches survived into the film, such as the uh, seemingly pointless change of Victor's name to Henry and the accidental lakeside drowning of a little girl by the monster. The creature in Webling's play has uh, been uh, re-endowed with the gift of speech and spends some time lamenting the death of the child, eventually crying out to God to help him. And there is actually one bolt of lightning in her play. It comes as God's answer to these prayers, 
killing the unhappy creature. Webling's script was uh, next rewritten by John Balderston and Garrett Fox, who had both adapted work for Universal's Dracula again. Balderston's script, from which the film was more directly adapted, received a very limited theatrical staging. It's in this production, for the first time, that electricity enters the picture in any big way. The Balderson uh, Garrett script describes Frankenstein's laboratory, not only piled with books, but also featuring... A tall, intricate machine of cords, batteries, metal discs, and such. And it's during a thunderstorm that this machine is deployed. At the storm's arrival, Frankenstein, according to stage directions... Goes back of the machine, comes out, waits, lightning outside, and instantly... A blue spark shoots from one disc to the other inside the machine. When James Whale agreed to direct the 1931 film, he embraced this aspect, expressing an interest in creating something like the elaborately equipped laboratory of Rotwang, the uh, mad scientist in the 1927 German film Metropolis. All that remained was to find an effects technician who might realize something like this. answer came in the person of studio electrician and inveterate tinkerer Kenneth Strickfaden. Upon graduating high school, Strickfaden was already working with Tesla coils and other electromechanical gizmos operating, maintaining, and modifying them for a traveling vaudeville outfit called Charles Willard's Temple of Music. For Frankenstein, he created a particularly large Tesla coil dubbed Megavolt Senior, he was responsible for all the other wonderfully sparking, flashing, zapping hardware in those scenes, as well as their names, some of which are used in the script. Neutron Analyzer, Baratron Generator, Cosmic Ray Diffuser. His devices continued to be recycled in other films into the 1940s and resurfaced in some Munsters episodes in the 60s and were later showcased in Mel Brooks' Young Frankenstein in 1974. With 1935's The Bride of Frankenstein, the budding franchise drew a bit closer to Shelley's novel, self-consciously so, actually, with a prologue featuring Elsa Lancaster, who later plays the bride at the film's climax, cast as Mary Shelley. I do think it a shame, Mary, to end your story quite so suddenly. That wasn't the end at all. Would you like to hear what happened after that? I feel like telling you. And the voice Shelley gave her creature, absent in 1931, is returned, albeit in rudimentary form. You stay. We belong dead. Ah. Ah. Shelley's theme of Prometheus snatching fire from the gods is nicely visualized in The Bride of Frankenstein, in the elevation of the creature's body toward the heavens in the creation sequence. This happens also in the 1931 film, but it's taken further in the sequel, in which we actually see more of the process, including lightning strikes connecting with the Frankenstein's hardware in the body. And in the 1935 film, a new method of reaching into the heavens to snatch that electricity was devised. We'll be here soon. The kites. Are the kites ready? Yes. Then send them up as soon as the wind rises. Hurry, hurry. The kites, the kites, get them ready. Just like old Ben Franklin. With this, I think we've completed the circuit, so to speak, of our electrical inquiry into Frankenstein, going from the subtle hints and clues about galvanism dropped into Shelley's book uh, to the uh, vivid depictions of electricity as integral to the Frankenstein myth. But to return for one last thought on Ben Franklin, if you're still having trouble imagining a kinship between America's avuncular founding father and the uh, grisly misdeeds of Victor Frankenstein, perhaps this will help make that connection. In 1998, during restoration of the house Franklin occupied in London while serving as ambassador for the American colonies, a gruesome discovery was made. The remains of more than 15 bodies buried in a secret windowless room beneath the garden. Six of them were children, some were apparently dismembered before burial. Many bones showed evidence of being sawed. 
and one skull had been trepanned or had a hole drilled in it. We can't know for certain, but historians believe these were objects of anatomical research conducted in Franklin's home. Whose bodies they were and how they were obtained, of course, is also not known. But given the times, uh, grave robbing or other nefarious methods would be likely. This is probably the work of Franklin's protege and tenant, the anatomist and physician William Hewson. But Franklin uh, famously had a wide-ranging thirst for knowledge. It's a little hard to imagine he didn't do a little cadaver dabbling himself. Another thing hard to imagine, with which I'll close, is the idea of Ben Franklin's spirit entering the body of an unruly Pennsylvania man, as in this case reported in May of 2017. This is the area of Scott Street in Penn Borough, where officers say they found a woman hiding under a tree. According to the criminal complaint, she says George Bernhardy Sr. was inside, throwing stuff around, breaking everything, claiming he attacked her and was intoxicated. When police entered the home, they say Bernhardy was standing shirtless and bloodied in the kitchen with a teapot in his hand. The criminal complaint says Bernhardy became irate and said, tase me, tase me, I'm Ben Franklin. I have my kite and key. Tease me, tease me, tease me, I'm Ben Franklin, I'm Ben Franklin. Tease me, tease me, I'm Ben Franklin, I'm Ben Franklin, Ben Franklin, Ben Franklin. I have my kite and key. I have my kite and key. Say Bernhardy continued to slam his head, claiming this time he is Rumpelstiltskin. I hope everyone's been enjoying our show and that you uh, might have the opportunity to share episodes with friends or even better, to leave a review or wherever you happen to listen. As I mentioned at the top of the show, these episodes only keep coming out because of the support that our friends on Patreon offer. When you donate, you're contributing toward the more than 100 hours of work I end up putting into each of these shows. Subscriptions begin at $1 a month. You can discontinue at any time. And those subscribing at the $4 level or higher now receive a short extra episode called Marvelous and Rare, consisting of extracts read from some of the curious old books from the uh, Bone and Sickle Library. It has the feel of one of these episodes, but a bit different. We've also added a uh, Bone and Sickle candle featuring the skeletal St. Notburga, as well as two different mystery kits, each one with unique offerings. And we still offer my Krampus book and the show soundscapes you hear in the background. I uh, do want to thank our new patrons, Bridget Case, Brian DeLacy, and Daniel Ologia, and to thank Neil Cochran, Casey Moriarty, and uh, Johanna Ust, if you're pronouncing it the German way, for uh, upping their pledges. And thank you to uh, BJ Artur108 for the uh, kind review. If you haven't yet, you might want to visit our website, boneandsickle.com. There you'll find links to our Patreon, Facebook group, Twitter, and Instagram, along with the show notes with links and images and other material related to the program. The show is written and produced by me, Al Reidenauer. Mrs. Carswell is played by Sarah Chavez, whose projects and writing related to death and culture you can track at sarah-chavez.com. Thanks so much for listening.